Hello, brothers and sisters. During this Thanksgiving time, I want to send a greeting uh, first from my family to yours. I hope that you are uh, enjoying all of the good things that this Thanksgiving season brings. Um, and tonight, before we dive into God's Word, I want to take an opportunity to offer a Thanksgiving testimony um, of my own. Um, I'm thankful for Jesus tonight, um, and I'm thankful for the salvation that he has given to me and that I have been able to enjoy. Um, during this pandemic time, I've had the opportunity to spend more um, time, and I would say um, maybe a quieter time uh, than I would normally get to spend in God's Word and, and just meditating on Him and praying. And that's become very sweet to me, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, also, many of you uh, know that this past year I started a new job. Um, and in that story, I've said it multiple times that um, I have seen God's hand leading me uh, first to the job that I have now. And then as I've been there, God's hand um, leading me and helping me, uh, helping me to let my light shine in this new place. Um, but God has been with me, and I'm just very thankful for that. Of course, I'm also thankful for the many blessings that God has given me in my life. Um, I, I, I have enjoyed a lot of God's favors uh, this year, um, but I'm very thankful for my family, a godly mother and father who uh, brought me up to know who Jesus uh, is, um, for a, a family that surrounds me and supports me and loves me, um, for the three kids that uh, we have in our own family um, who are a constant delight to me every day, and of course for my wife Naomi who is a constant uh, companion, friend, advisor, uh, confidant, um, who is a great partner that God has given to me. I'm thankful for these things and for so much else, of course, as I'm sure many of you, your hearts are uh, overflowing with thanksgiving as well. Um, and uh, I share that thanksgiving. Um, as we uh, look into God's word tonight, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles uh, to our text, which is going to be found in Luke, the 17th chapter. Um, specifically, we're going to be starting in the 11th verse, and we'll go through the 19th verse. Um, this is the story of the 10 lepers, um, and it has some important lessons for us uh, to teach us about thankfulness. But before we dive into God's word, uh, let's uh, bow our heads and let's pray. Um, dear Father, we come to you tonight with hearts open in praise and thanksgiving. And as the season reminds us of being thankful tonight, I pray that you would move our hearts to the object of our thanksgiving, that is Jesus Christ, and the way that he has opened up for us to have fellowship with you, God. I pray that as we look into your word, you would open our hearts and minds to see what you have to say to us. I pray that, you would be, that we would be obedient as a people, and that as your word says in James, you would help us to be those who are not just hearers of your word, but doers as well. We ask this all in your name. And for the name, and in the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Recently, in our family, uh, we were reading through the book uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, for those of you who have had the opportunity to read through it, it's a it's a fun book, um, and I won't go through all of the details of it. But uh, one of the things that's interesting, at least from a from a summary perspective, uh, the way that the book goes is um, there is a very poor boy who um, lives in a town or a city that. Um, there is a, a chocolate factory, and that chocolate factory has an owner, um, and there is, a, I guess you could call it a raffle that takes place. Um, and this owner sends out in the bars of chocolate that come from the factory uh, some number of golden tickets. Um, and through a series of events, Charlie, this poor boy, uh, finds that he is the owner and, and the recipient of one of these tickets that comes through a chocolate bar that, that he gets as a gift. And so he takes that bar and he takes that, that ticket and then he goes to the factory. Um, and he's in that factory uh, to go on a tour with a number of other children. Um, and as those children go through that factory, what ends up happening is that uh, um, each one of the children uh, have some sort of a, a funny mishap that takes place. Um, one of them, I think, goes into a, a, a river of chocolate. Another one blows up, I believe, into being a blueberry. Uh, another one is shrunk down very, very small, and others are, are caught in various machinery inside of the factory and different things such as that. Um, all but Char all, This happens to all of the children except for Charlie, uh, who goes through the tour uh, and comes through the end uh, unscathed. 
And it's because of that, that, that Charlie goes through this, because of that, that the owner of the factory, Willy Wonka, uh, reveals that the real reason for the golden ticket raffle, the real reason why he brought all of these children into the factory um, was because he was looking for someone to be his successor, the owner uh, of the factory after Willy Wonka uh, is gone. And so because of that, Charlie becomes the next owner um, of that chocolate factory. Now, uh, what happens to the other children? Or what happened? What, what, what was the problem with the other children? Well, you could say that um, each of the other children could not see past the reward of the factory tour. While they were on that factory tour, they saw that for all that it was. It was, uh, it was um, the fulfillment of getting that, that ticket and being able to go there and, and enjoy all that that factory tour was for. Um, but the problem was that as a result of seeing that as the end goal, their misbehavior actually disqualified them from being able to see past that initial gift to the giver and ultimately to the inheritance that that giver, Willy Wonka, ultimately wanted for them to have. Um, now, that's obviously a little bit of a silly, whimsical story, but the, the lesson there of being able to um, see past the gift onto the giver is something that we're going to see tonight as we look into our text. So let's go ahead and read that together. Again, just a reminder, that's in Luke, the 17th chapter, and we'll begin in the 11th verse. It says there, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing, this is Jesus, was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Um, so we come into this story. Uh, and this miracle takes place at a time, uh, or excuse me, within a, a, a context that Bible commentators refer to as the journey section of the book of Luke. And it's during this section that roughly five miracles take place. Um, and in each one of these miracles, what we see is that the miracle itself, itself is less important than the result of that miracle. And we find that to be true here in this story. Um, when we come to the scene, we find Jesus traveling with his disciples. Um, and Jesus is traveling from Galilee, which is in the north, and he's going southwest through Samaria. Um, and he's on his way down uh, south in the, in the country, down to uh, Judea, which is where Jerusalem is found. And as he is traveling from the north uh, to the south, he enters a village, which would make sense. He's traveling along and the villages, there's villages, I'm sure, along the road that he was traveling. Um, and as he's traveling, he enters one of these villages. And enter, upon entering the village, he is met by these 10 lepers. Um, and it tells us that these 10 lepers were standing a distance from Jesus, which shouldn't surprise us. Um, Leprosy uh, was a disease of the skin that caused rashes and loss of feeling and even limbs to die and fall off. And so uh, in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus and in Numbers, there's very strict prescriptions for what needs to happen when someone has leprosy. They're, they need to stay far off. They need to be at a distance from the rest of the population. And that was the case with these 10 lepers here. Um, but not only is uh, leprosy uh, a, 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 a disease that we see in the Bible, but leprosy is also in, in a lot of ways a, a type um, and a metaphor for sin that we have in our lives. In the same way that uh, leprosy is a disease that starts on the inside but then manifests itself on the outside, sin is similar to that. Uh, leprosy starts small but then it spreads over the entirety of uh, the, the, the person's body who has it to the point where it becomes all con consuming. Um, and then in some respects, it actually takes over the identity of the person. That person is called and referred to as a leper. A leper. And then ultimately, a leper is po powerless to heal themselves. There's nothing that a leper could do to, to cleanse themselves from this disease. 
Um, they need outside intervention, if at all that is to happen. Um, and as we're reading through this story, it's important for us as readers to put ourselves into the place of these lepers and to see um, the story through their eyes. Um, it is, uh, it's interesting that we see that as the lepers approach, or don't approach, but as they call out to Jesus, um, they call out to Jesus and they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, that's an interesting thing because clearly it seems that these men uh, know and have familiarity with who Jesus is. Now, we don't know exactly why that is the case. Um, one of the things that we can say, and this is just speculation, but we do know that in Luke chapter 5, there's an example of Jesus healing a leper where he touches that leper and that leper is 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 healed. And so maybe it could be the case that uh, maybe all of the lepers talk to one another. This was in the northern part of the country. So maybe Jesus healed that leper and and that healing went through the leper community and it and it spread. And so these lepers understood who Jesus was because of what it was that he could do um, for them, for lepers, for people who were in this particular uh, situation who had this disease. Um, and so there was a familiarity that came from uh, from that. Again, we don't know how. This is all just speculation. But clearly, the text seems to indicate to us that they knew that they knew who Jesus was. Well, for whatever the reason, um, it tells us that Jesus then responds to these men. He calls back to them and tells them what they need to do. Uh, he tells them that they need to go and they need to show themselves to the priest. Now, this again also is in keeping with what the Old Testament tells us about leprosy and how uh, leprosy is supposed to be dealt with. Um, the, what was supposed to happen was a priest or priest would, would meet the lepers. Um, the lepers would be outside of the camp um, and they were to be looked over. The, the priest would look over the leper to see if in fact um, the disease was gone or if the disease was still on the leper. Only a priest could declare that the leprosy had gone. And Jesus tells them, uh, go and show yourselves to the priest. And so that's the reason why that is uh, the direction. It's consistent with God's word. Um, but then this is when the miracle enters. Uh, the miracle enters the, the, the situation. Um, the text tells us that they were cleansed, which is to say they were, they were healed from their leprosy as they went. Um, it's interesting to, to, to see that because it's, in, it's different than what we see in Luke 5 with the leper who was healed there. In Luke 5, the leper was touched. In this particular case, these lepers are healed as they're on their way to show themselves to the priests. Now, why is this? Um, well, there could be a number of reasons, but there's a number of things that we observe from, from seeing that as the direction. The first is that um, these men had to trust what Jesus was saying, and they needed to have faith in the one who was saying it. Um, if, for instance, they had said, well, hold on a second, I heard about a situation where Jesus healed the leper, and when Jesus healed that leper, Jesus had to touch them, and so I want that. That's what I want. Jesus, touch me. That's what I need you to do, Jesus. Um, but that's not what it says here. It says that these men went, and in going, they were healed and they were cleansed on the way. And so because they weren't disobedient, but rather because they were obedient, they were cleansed. Another thing that this shows us is the power of the word of God. Um, Jesus is the Logos. Jesus is the word of God. And just by his speaking, by his proclamation, he is able to make um, he's made, able to, to, to make the, the universe and nature and even disease, um, you know, uh, obey his word. And so just by speaking that word, Jesus is able to, uh, to heal these men. And then the final thing that I'll say, I would say here, that's just an interesting thing to note is that when Jesus directs the men to go and these men go to the priests and they find out that they have been healed, it's an example of the old Testament um, law giving testimony to who Jesus is because Jesus now speaks the word and healing comes and that it's confirmed by the law from the Old Testament. It's just interesting to see how the entirety of the Bible is one story and that of course is the story of Jesus Christ and what he came to do to rescue us from our sin. But getting back to this story here um, specifically and what it is that it's showing us. So what a remarkable story, right? Um, here you have these 10 men 
they hear about Jesus. They call him master, um, which is something that's interesting in and of itself. Um, they know who he is. Um, they know what he's capable of doing. They obey him. They trust him. They have faith. And they go to the, the priest and they're healed. Amazing, right? Now let's pray in closing. Well, well, maybe not quite yet. Um, there's more to the story. And this is the part of the story where Thanksgiving comes into the picture. Um, and it's the part of the story that for us is the most important part for us to pay attention to. But before we continue, I want you to think about something in your own life. Um, something maybe that was recent or maybe sometime in the past. Or, but, but think about a time where you got something that you really wanted that you were really looking for, that you really desired. Um, perhaps it was a gift, uh, perhaps a job, perhaps it was a relationship. And I want you to remember how you felt in that moment when you re you got that thing, when you received it. Um, sure, there was joy, there was excitement, perhaps there was relief um, from getting this thing. But now I need to ask you this question. In all of those emotions, did you feel thankful now, you might answer uh, and say, yes, of course I was thankful. That's that's definitely something that I felt. Um, but I want to push a little bit further, and I'm, I'm asking myself this question. Trust me, this this text has dealt with me as, as, as before anyone else, of course. Um, but I want to push a little bit more on that, and I want to say, um, if you say that you were thankful, did your thankfulness express itself in any kind of action? Um, if you received something from someone, did, did, you, uh, did you go to them and express your appreciation um, in some tangible way? Um, if you, uh, you, know, if, if you received something, and uh, did you bow your head in, in prayer, um, maybe audible prayer, perhaps with your family? Did you call your family together and pray and offer thanksgiving? Um, I want us to do this little thought experiment because it's helpful for us to understand the next part of the story. Um, I want to read it again a little bit more clearly because there's a couple of lessons that we're going to extract from this. Beginning in the 15th verse, it says, Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, verse 15 is a really pivotal point in this story. As I said at the beginning, it's the response to the miracle which is actually more important in this story than the miracle itself. We find that of the ten that were healed, only one returned to Jesus to be thankful. And this shows us the importance of thanksgiving. And perhaps this is a theme that we've seen from even the last two uh, sermons on this topic that we've heard. And there's a theme there that suggests that thankfulness for us is hard. Ingratitude is much more of a natural state of the human heart. It's not thankfulness which is the natural state of the human heart, but rather ingratitude. So this, man's, uh, this man returns to Jesus and was praising God with a loud voice. Um, but when he reaches Jesus, he falls down on his face at Jesus' feet and gives Jesus thanks. What can we see from this man's response, this Samaritan's response to Jesus? The first observation that we want to make is that real thankfulness, and we'll describe this man as expressing and, and exhibiting to us real thankfulness, Real thankfulness leads to action. Real thankfulness leads to action. How many times have I said in my heart um, that I feel thankful? How many times has that been something that maybe you've said inside your mind? Yes, I have a thankful heart. But it never causes us to do anything about it. Um, sure, we say, I'm thankful for my salvation. Um, I've been a Christian. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian after all. Of course, I'm thankful for my salvation. But does that drive us? to do anything? Does that drive us to share our testimony? Does it drive us to bear witness to the name of Christ? We say, Jesus knows how we feel. Why do we need to say it out loud? 
But all the while, will we allow that to take place and not actually drive, have that thankfulness drive us to some kind of action? I wonder if there's a little bit of ingratitude that's in there. Perhaps we're taking it a little bit for granted. I know that's something that's pricked my heart a little bit. How much do I take my salvation for granted? And how much am I truly thankful for it? Um, but continuing on for here, where else, what else do we see from this man? Well, we see that this man um, was pressed, or excuse me, he pressed on to have a personal interaction with Jesus. And that interaction was different than the interaction that those other nine lepers had. The difference between that one leper and the nine is apparent, but before we go to the difference, let's first look at the similarities. The first thing that we'll see is that they all knew Jesus. They all knew who Jesus was. Remember when they were calling out to him, they knew his name. They knew he was Jesus. The second thing is they all knew what Jesus was capable of. They all referred to him as master. They all heard the command from Jesus to go to the priest. And each and every one of those ten had faith as they went on their way to the priest. They all re received the gift of being cleansed from their leprosy. But all but one of them missed the giver. All but one of them missed the greatest gift that was being offered and was available to them, which was Jesus. And the thing that separated all of the, those nine who received all of those other things and knew all of those other things, the thing that separated them, the key that opened the lock for this one man was thankfulness. Let's take a look at this man and see what it was that drove him to come back. The thankfulness that he felt in his heart. Um, now, we as Christians ought to have that same thankfulness bubbling up in our heart. Um, we heard this last week from Brother Matt when he was talking. He was talking about the fact that as we receive good gifts from God, as we receive blessings, how do we see those blessings? In what light do those blessings shine for us? Or sh what, what are those, um, what are those uh, gifts look like to us in the light of everything else? And uh, a couple of us in the uh, young adult class, we had a conversation about this. Um, last week after listening to Brother Matt. And one of the things that we were talking about is that when you look at gifts that God gives to us, um, we as Christians should be those that in every gift that is given, we should be able to find a string that, tie, that is tied directly back to heaven, directly back to Jesus. A believer's true thankfulness ought to be found in looking for that string that, is, that ties us back to Jesus. True thankfulness should drive us all, just like this man, to the feet of Jesus. And then the last thing that I want to, or the last lesson that I think that we'll see tonight, or at least that we'll take time to look at tonight, comes to us not from how the man acted, but rather from how Jesus responded to him. In verse 19, Jesus says, And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, not only did the man's thankfulness lead him to action and also lead him to the feet of Jesus, but by coming to Jesus, he's the only one who Jesus says to him, your faith has made you well. It's in this pronouncement that the man becomes the only one who, who, who after he's healed, he presses past the gift and he was commended by the giver. Each of the other lepers had their immediate needs met, but they missed out on the person of Jesus. And brother and sister, for each one of us, this is the key point. There's lots of blessings that come into our life, and there are good things that come to us from God. But these are just tokens of God's love to us. The real purpose of the blessings that God gives to us is to bring us closer to the giver, to bring us closer into a relationship with God. These tokens are things that are meant to remind us and point us in the direction of God. 
They are meant to be the key that unlocks for us an opportunity to come into a closer relationship with God. You see, if you give a gift to somebody and they don't say thank you to you or they don't show their appreciation to you, you can feel a certain amount of loss. It certainly could be the case where you feel like you weren't appreciated or you feel like the person didn't recognize maybe how you sacrificed to give something to them or the money that you spent on it or the time that you spent on it or whatever the case might be. You as the giver can feel a sense of loss. But that's just with natural relationships. You see, in relationships with God, it's completely different. See, God doesn't need us to make him feel good. He's not looking for us to stroke his divine ego or anything like that. Because God is already fully complete. When we're thankful to God, or maybe I should put it this way, when we're not thankful to God, when we are unthankful, God is not diminished by that. We are. But when we are thankful to God, we get not only the gift that God has given to us, but more than that, we are able and invited to come into a closer relationship with God before, because of that. And that is something that we should see when we're truly thankful. It actually helps us, it helps to bring us closer into the arms of God, into a closer relationship with him. Now, there's one more thought yet that I want to leave with you um, that has to do with a peculiar word that's found in the 18th verse. Jesus says there, Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Now, it feels oddly specific, the word that's used here, the word translated as foreigner or stranger. That word is actually, and if I'm pronouncing it closely, it's allogenes. Um, And it's actually found nowhere else in the New Testament, but here in this story. But you see, this word choice was no accident. For those who would have heard it that were Jewish, they would have understood that this word stranger here was the same word that was used on the signs in the Jewish temple to forbid foreigners from coming into the innermost courts of the temple. And I think that when Jesus was saying this, he wasn't saying this towards this man with any sense of malice, but rather he was looking forward. Now, what do I mean by that? The Bible tells us in Matthew 27 that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil that separated God's presence from the people was torn from top to bottom. And that removed the barrier between God and his people. And because of the work of the cross, God and his people were brought into close relationship with one another because of what Jesus did. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 14, it tells us that Christ broke down the dividing wall, not just between God and the Jews, but between God and all people. So now all people can come into a close relationship with God. Now, friend, if you're listening to this message tonight and you don't know Christ... If you are a stranger, then I want you to hear tonight that this story is for you too. That God is calling to you too. See, God sent his son to die on a cross so that he could remove your sins and bring you back into fellowship with himself. The Bible tells us that Jesus was hung on a cross outside the the, the camp. He was outside the wall. He was where the strangers were. Jesus went to where we were as strangers, and it was in that place that Jesus died. And in dying on the cross, he made a way for each and every one of us, no matter our background, no matter our sin, for us to be cleansed from that sin and to be brought into a closer relationship with him. And I just want to say to my brothers and sisters, and maybe to those of you who might be strangers and don't know Jesus as your Savior, in this Thanksgiving season, no matter where you find yourself, there's nothing that holds you back from falling down on your feet, sorry, from falling down on your face at Jesus' feet in worship and true thankfulness to God for the gifts that he's given to us, but more importantly, for the gift of Jesus Christ.
Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Father, we, we thank you that through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, we can come into fellowship with you. I pray that you would forgive us where our thankfulness has fallen short of the true thankfulness that ought to be in our hearts. This Thanksgiving season, I pray that you would once again call to our minds the wonder of what you have done for us. Help us to be truly thankful and to worship at the feet of Jesus. In his name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you for spending this time with me tonight. Uh, once again, I want to wish you and your family a very happy Thanksgiving. May God bless you in the time that you spend remembering all of God's goodness and all of his faithfulness to you. God bless you.